you all for having me here today. My name is Gail Rubin. I am the author of a book called A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. And in fact, I am a neighbor of yours. I live over in the Altura Edition neighborhood. So uh, it wasn't long for me to get here. And I just returned from a trip last weekend to Nederland, Colorado for the Frozen Dead Guy Days Festival. And yes, there is a real frozen dead guy at the center of it all. His name is Brito Morstel, a Norwegian who died in 1989 at the age of 89 of a heart condition. Well, and you know, he's kind of getting up there in years. His grandson is named Trigve, and he had his own ideas about what he wanted done with grandpa's body which was he packed him in dry ice, shipped him to the United States to a cryogenic facility in California, and Grandpa was put into a deep freeze. About 1993, Trigbe decided he wanted to start his own cryogenic facility in Nederland, which is this tiny town. You know where Nederland is? It's up there west of Boulder in the mountains. And he built this bomb-proof house, and he put his grandfather and another client in a shed in a box surrounded by dry ice. Now, I got to tell you, this, cryogenically speaking, is not cold enough, really, for true reanimation. But he was into this. <laughs> and it turned out, long story short, um, Trig Bay's visa ran out, and he was deported back to Norway. His mother was left there in Netherlands taking care of Grandpa and this other body. And she was about to be deported because her visa ran out. And she was like, but what are we going to do about the bodies, she said to a reporter. And everybody said, what bodies? <laughs> Whereupon the town council promptly outlawed the keeping of bodies on your property in Netherlands. But because he was already there, he was grandfathered in. Yes, yes. So then the Chamber of Commerce decided it would be a good idea to celebrate Grandpa's on ice existence when they started Frozen Dead Guy Days. And I was just up there as the doyen of death presenting the newly dead game, which is like the newly wed game, except the questions are how well you know your partner's last wishes. Very interesting stuff. I've got the three games on YouTube if you want to take a look for it. Just go Google the newly dead game. So I, I mention all of this to you because I'm pretty sure Grandpa wasn't planning on being frozen after he died. Yet his heirs just did what they wanted to do. So what are your plans? What idea do you have for what you want done with your body? There are three really good reasons to plan ahead. Number one, you can avoid stress at a time of grief. Now let me back up and tell you how I became the doyen of death. I'm from a background of public relations and event planning. And I got married for the second time in the year of 2000, and my husband and I had a very creative Jewish Western wedding. I wore cowboy boots and a red dress and a black jacket with fringes and beads, and we had our guest dress in Western wear, and we had the reception at Los Amigos Roundup in the North Valley, which has sawdust on the floor. We had a Western swing band, and everybody had such a good time. They said that was the best wedding they'd ever been to. And I was all jazzed to write a book about creative life cycle events and call it Matchings, Hatchings, and Dispatchings for weddings, births, and deaths. And I actually got to write a column in the Albuquerque Tribune by that name. And it was the columns on death and funerals that got the most reader response. And it told me there's a real need for this information. People want to talk about it, but they don't want to talk about it. So, and I figured there are plenty of books about creative wedding planning, but there weren't hardly any at the time about funeral planning. A few have come on the scene, but I was first. <laughs> so I decided, well, I guess I'd better plan a funeral for somebody, because I had not done that at the time. So we picked on my father-in-law, Norm, who was 79 at the time and was you know, getting up in years and had had three open heart surgeries in his life. And after the third one, he was in a coma for 10 days and came out of that coma and his doctor said, you better get your affairs in order. 
So Norm had gotten advanced directives and done financial planning and all that stuff, but somehow just didn't get around to funeral planning. So I volunteered to go and do a funeral plan for him. And he said, just a simple casket, that's all I want. And well, that's not a lot of guidance, but we figured we would do pretty much a, a Jewish tradition kind of funeral. Well, I was amazed how much information we needed when we got there that we didn't have. And I was really glad he was still alive to provide that information. So over dinner one night with my in-laws, uh, I bring up this up, and Norm's like, oh, sure, I'll get you my veterans information and my social security number and the family history, and, and I'm going to write my own obituary. I was thinking, All right, he's really into this. This is good. And then I look over at my mother-in-law, and she's looking down at the roast beef and the mashed potatoes and the peas. It's like those little monkeys, you know, doesn't want to hear about it, doesn't want to think about it, doesn't want to talk about it. But we got past that. Denial is not a river in Egypt. And he actually, he actually did not die uh, until three years later. He fell, broke his hip was hospitalized, had a hip replacement, pneumonia. It was a battle back and forth, but seven weeks of deterioration. And on his third ER admission, they said, we can't fix him. We can make him comfortable and just let nature take its course. So this is where advanced directives and funeral planning come together when we talk about avoiding stress at a time of grief. Even though he had advanced directives, and maybe some of you have witnessed this in your own families, the out-of-town relative wants to save their life, do everything possible for them. Norm's directives were to be kept comfortable, but not heroic measures. And my brother-in-law, who lives on the East Coast, well, came in and he was like, fix him, you know, tube feeding, other treatments, make him better. Well, that lasted for about two, three days, and then they realized, you know what, this is futile. And Norm was not benefiting from those efforts. In fact, he was, it was not, co not comfortable for him. So we were all there when he died. It was a beautiful thing to witness. It was a peaceful passing. And the next day when we went to the funeral home, it was easy. It was quick. There was not much my brother-in-law could argue with because this was his wishes that we had set up. And even my mother-in-law said, you know, I really didn't like it at the time when you were pre-planning, but now when we needed it, I'm really glad it was done. So that gave me my mission to go out and help start this conversation. My motto is, just like talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead. <laughs> Your family will benefit from the conversation. So, avoiding stress at a time of grief and help, helping to head off family conflicts is good reason number one. Number two, you can save a lot of money. A lot of people have no concept of how expensive funerals are. They're among the top five, they can be among the top five expenses that a household will face, you know, after your house and your wedding and your cars and maybe college education, funerals can be up there. We're talking anywhere from ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, depending on how fancy you want to get, which is why cremation has been experiencing such a big boom over the past five years as the economy's taken a dive. And... For example, I, I had the uh, opportunity to meet a famous public speaker, but maybe you haven't heard of her. Her name is Glenna Salisbury. And she told me a story of her husband, who was on kidney dialysis for the last few months of his life. And even knowing this, they had not pre-planned. And he died on Good Friday in the afternoon, and she was sitting next to his body in the hospital, wondering what to do next. And a nurse handed her the yellow pages and said, find a funeral home, give him a call, and you know, have them take his body. So she basically picked a establishment out of the yellow pages. And the next day, Saturday, she went with her two daughters 
to the funeral home to start making arrangements and discovered that they want, uh, well, they, they gave them tea and cookies and were having a nice little chat. And she's discovering that the casket that they were looking at was $8,000 just for the casket. And she said her husband, Jim, well, he wasn't buried yet, he would have been spinning at the thought of being buried in an $8,000 casket. So she said, give me those yellow pages. And she opened up and found a direct cremation place to come and take his body and cremate him for $1,000. And her daughters were aghast. They were like, how can you do this? I mean, they've been very nice to us here, and they've given us tea and cookies and everything else. And she was like, not $8,000 worth of tea and cookies. So you need to shop around before you need these services and find out what they cost and what you can afford and what you want to have. That's the third reason, creating a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. I think a lot of people, and maybe you've all been there, have been to services that could be anybody in that casket or in that urn. It's not about that particular person. It's just sort of a cookie cutter experience. I became a certified celebrant last year as part of my um, transformation from a public relations professional to someone who helps people talk about and deal with funerals. I'm not a funeral planner, a funeral director per se, but I am very familiar with the field. And uh, I joined our cemetery committee for Congregation Albert, so I know a lot about cemetery management. <laughs> And the Hever Kedisha, which is the Jewish burial society that washes and dresses the bodies of Jews for burial. It's, it's an amazing experience. So one story I'd like to share with you about the idea of planning ahead. My next door neighbor is Mary Adams. And Mary, in her last year, was on oxygen all the time. She was uh, at her home. She stayed in her home up until her final days, and she had me come over to talk with her and her son, Michael, about what she wanted whenever that time came. So I am sad to tell you that she did pass on this just this Thursday. But she was at home, her son, Michael, and her sister, Jean, were by her side, and it was a peaceful passing. And that was at about 11 o'clock in the morning, and at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Michael called me and said, well, come on over, let's figure out what we're going to do to celebrate her life. And we already knew a great deal of what we were going to do. We knew she wanted to be cremated, that we would have a public service where I'm sure hundreds of people are going to come because she had a, a great impact with a number of communities. The music the poetry, the poems, the kind of readings and people to speak. We all knew, and it was just like, okay, let's get to work on pulling this together. This is the party that no one wants to plan, but if you do plan ahead and, and write it down and let your loved ones know this is what I want, it does help so much to create something meaningful and memorable and makes it so much easier for the family. So a couple of things I wanted to also share with you um, are about cremation and green issues <coughs> regarding funeral arrangements. And then if you have some questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Cremation, the cremation rate in North America, here in the United States, was 15% in 1985. And then in 2007, it was up to 35%. You mean the number of people, the number of people choosing cremation over burial. Yeah. And then in 2010, it jumped up to 41% of the population choosing cremation. This is a, a nationwide average. And it's estimated 50, it will reach the 50% mark by 2018. Now, a big driver of that jump, of course, is cost. Here in Albuquerque, you can get a direct cremation, no service, uh, for about $900 cheapest. Other 
some funeral homes charge about $2,000, 2300 for the same service. If, if you didn't know that, you know, if you just went with the first funeral home that you called, you could save yourself a great deal of money by shopping around. Uh, also, in New Mexico, you need to have the death certificate reviewed by the Office of the Medical Investigator. They have to look at paperwork before you're cremated because if, God forbid, there's some kind of criminal activity going on, you're destroying evidence. So, and they charge $125 to review those papers before cremation takes place. Any of you know that? Yes. So, uh, and if you're counting on something like life insurance to pay for a funeral, you have to wait until the death certificate is produced before the insurance company will pay off. Guess what? It took eight weeks for us to get the death certificate for my father-in-law because of all of his back and forth between the rehab facility and the hospital, you know, three ER admissions, and they're like, you know, what? And then people go on vacation, and, you know, things just kind of drag along. But if you're waiting for that money from the insurance settlement, how are you going to handle those finances between now and then? There are ways of saving money for a funeral. You can set up something called a Totten Trust or Payable on Death account that will allow the person you put in charge to access that money immediately after death so they can handle their affairs for you. But again, this is something you have to set up and think about before things happen. And when you think about green issues, how many of you consider yourself green? Recycle, you garden, you conserve energy. Okay, good. If you are thinking about cremation, you might think it's green because, okay, you're not taking up space in a, in a cemetery. Um, and in fact, tr traditional funerals use a lot of resources. You've got embalming fluid going into the ground, which is basically formaldehyde and toxic chemicals pumped into the body. You don't have to be embalmed. Embalming is not a requirement, unless you're going to put the body on display. And that's a question you need to ask yourself. Do you want to be put on display for people to look at? It's not my personal tradition, but it's something you need to think about and talk about. So if you didn't get put on display, you wouldn't need to be embalmed. They can refrigerate you for up to four days. Um, or longer, depending on, you know, how long it takes to get these things pulled together. Then, um, the amount of metal in, in steel caskets, copper and bronze, that goes into the ground, also for vaults, enough metal to build a Golden Gate Bridge every single year goes into the ground. Wow. And enough concrete in, in uh, concrete vaults goes into the ground to build a two-lane highway from New York to Detroit every single year going into the ground. So traditional burials got quite a, a resource impact. Cremation also has a carbon footprint that you need to be aware of. While you're not taking up space in a landfill, the natural gas that's burned to fire the retort and brings the temperature up to like 1,500 degrees to vaporize the body, basically, generates 532 pounds of CO2 per cremation. Now, to give you a little perspective on that, I have solar panels on my house. I'm very proud of my electric solar panel, 4.05 kilowatt system. And it tells me how much CO2 I'm offsetting by generating electricity from the sun. And I would have to run my solar panels for 14 sunny New Mexico days to offset one cremation. So that does have a carbon footprint. By the way, while I'm talking about cremation, I have some cremated remains in this box. <laughs> Has anybody seen cremated remains? If you're curious, um, I will pass this around. These are the cremated remains of a friend of my brother's. This is part of the mortal remains of John Ognebeni, who was a teacher, and my brother assured me that 
he would uh, be happy to <laughs> continue educating people in, from the great beyond. So to pass that around. Uh, and really, shop around early. It is a fascinating shopping trip, for one thing. And it's much better to do it before somebody dies. In uh, my book, A Good Goodbye, you know, planning for those who don't plan to die, I tell the story of going around shopping for my friend Gary, who wanted to pre-plan a simple cremation. And we were at one of our local funeral homes and having a really jolly conversation about things you can do with cremated remains. You know, you can put them in marine reefs, you can put them into fireworks and shoot them into the sky, you can scatter them just about anywhere. Uh, in fact, for disposition at sea, the rule is you should go three miles offshore. I don't know, when you look at those cremated remains, I don't know that anybody's going to like know the difference if you stood right on the beach and did it. But <laughs> And, in fact, I bet you there are hundreds of bodies scattered on top of Sandia Mountain, but nobody knows. And, in fact, it's sort of a don't ask, don't tell situation, unless the congressman's office can tell me otherwise. <laughs> okay. Outside of our purview. As long as you don't try to put a memorial marker on public land where you've scattered. Nobody can. Pardon? Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody knows. I mean, how are you going to tell? Yeah, those remains feel like sand. Yes, exactly. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But it's bone. It's yes, else? primarily ground up bone. Is and that, is that the entire? Remains? No, that's just a por a portion of the remains. Usually, with a, a full, um, you know, a regular human sized body, you'll probably get a container, like a round container about that size, or a square box about that big of about three to five pounds of that kind of okay, substance. Two, three pounds of tin of coffee? <clears throat> yes. In fact, I would like to all invite you all to, um, I, I use funny films to help start serious funeral planning conversations. And I'm putting a new collection of films together that I'm calling Ashes to Ashes, Dust in Your Face, Cremation, Comedy, and Creativity. And I've got clips from a number of different movies that show different elements where we'll talk about things about cremation that uh, are illustrated by scenes from movies. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, John. <laughs> Two days ago, there was a seminar, estate planning, mm -hmm. and I went to that. The a lawyer there said, not only is it helpful to have a will in your, uh, but also to have a trust, and she named something else. Advanced directives? Yeah. Well, she talked about Will's advanced trust. directives, but there was something else, too. It was amazing to know legally mm -hmm. how much is involved. Mm -hmm. Power of attorney, I'll bet. She talked about power of attorney? Yeah. So mm -hmm. Advanced directives? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was starting to talk about Gary and our meeting with the funeral home, and we were just having a great old time talking about all the fun things you can do with cremated remains and laughing in a funeral home. And at some point, another funeral director came and closed the door to the conference room where we were sitting because there was a bereaved family out in the lobby. And our laughter was in stark contrast to the grief that they were going through right then. But this is why it's important to go and do it ahead of time. You can joke about it. You can make plans, and you're not under pressure. So, um, any any questions at this point that I could help answer for you? Yes. So, is there a place in New Mexico where you can really have a green burial? A green burial ground is actually in the works outside of Santa Fe, near the El Dorado community. Uh -huh. uh, it is not online yet but it is getting close. And by the way, you can get the closest to a natural, to a green burial in a conventional cemetery by following the Jewish or Muslim burial traditions, which is no embalming. So usually the burial is hand, handled very quickly. 
The body is dressed in cotton or linen clothing and put in a pine or poplar softwood casket. In fact, there's an outfit out in Moriarty called the Plain Pine Box, the Old Pine Box, which uh, will make um, caskets for you at a very reasonable cost, like $750, $800. And, um, and then the, the, ca the body and the clothing and the casket all deteriorate at about the same rate. And the body is put into the grave in contact with the earth. And the cemetery will probably ask for, uh, have you put a plastic, uh, what's called the liner. So it's kind of like a dome that goes over the casket to help support the earth from falling as, as things return to the earth. So that, and you can do that in any cemetery here in New Mexico. You don't have to be in a Jewish cemetery to have that done. So, yes. This is a naive question, but does the body have to be in a casket? Muslims can get away with um, just doing it in a shroud. Yeah. Uh, I think in a conventional cemetery, they will request that you have some kind of container. What about the but, but in this green burial ground, you will be able to be buried in a shroud. But also, they don't they have wicker baskets? Yes. Baskets? Well, in fact, my husband does the laundry in our family, <laughs> and we have pre-planned, and in fact, he will be buried in a wicker basket casket because mm -hmm. of his laundry connection. <laughs> <laughs> Hard conversation. I mean, I think of my mother, who's now 85 or 86, full of life. I mean, how on earth would I ever say anything, you know, to get this conversation going? I mean, well, I mean, you can say you heard me talk. She'd rather be lying <laughs> on her deathbed, and then we'll talk about it. You know. Well, you know, share share some of the stories that I've shared with you. My my next door neighbor, Mary, was you know very thoughtful in terms of starting that conversation with her son and really forearming us to help celebrate her life in the best way possible. And I think what you said about um, talking about doesn't cause death. That's right. Just like talking about so sex won't well, make you pregnant. <laughs> 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 you know, it's hard to talk about sex with your parents. <laughs> I have some experience. My parents, we never knew any of our grandparents. We didn't have any. And so when my parents died long ago, they were quite old, and my brothers independent, one for my mother and one for my father. And they called me and said, who are our grandparents? They didn't know. And the only reason I knew is that I've been doing a lot of research. But it's important to know who the, who the ancestors are. Mm -hmm. it's, on the, um, it's on the death certificate. Well, the parents, yes, uh, the parents are on the death certificate, but not necessarily the grandparents. But it's good to well, know. For those example, things. for yeah. my mother, I wanted to know what her maiden name was. My brothers didn't know that. Exactly. You, that's one of those things. The five things you must know now about anybody in your family mother's maiden name, that goes on a death certificate, a uh, place, the place of birth. And if you moved around a lot as a kid, maybe you're. you're your siblings are born in different places. Social security number, of course. And think about that. You know your own. Maybe you know your spouses. But do you know your parents if you're age, going to be planning for age. your parents? Some people didn't know the age. Yeah, well, exactly the, the exact date of birth. And veterans information. If you have somebody who's a veteran in your family, you want to know where that paperwork is so that you can take advantage of benefits from the government. <laughs> and the fifth thing is not on death certificates, but online passwords. Think about this. In our online age, if you die and take your passwords with you, you're going to leave your loved ones in a heap of trouble. The lady back there and then I'll, yes. Have there been any studies done on the impact of the I'm not aware of any studies that talk about the impact of the scattering of cremated remains, but think about it, it's, it's calcium. Um, we're, we're calcifying the, <laughs> the, adding a little beneficial calcium to the earth. 
but I, I, I don't think it has an impact, but that's a good question, and I'm going to check into that and let you know. I was just going to say, my mom, I really deeply get insight. She has the book, she says, when her friends come, she told me where the book is, she told me everything that's in there, and I, in return, have started that as well. Good. With my family, and the passwords, account numbers, mm. but I have got my book ready, and they just know where it is. <laughs> so, it, yeah, I mean, it's a really good thing to have. Well, and in fact, I do offer on my website, which is a goodgoodbye.com, a downloadable <laughs> planning form that lists all those kind of things to think about and to write down. Yeah. Uh, one of the most difficult things that was brought up on this seminar the other day was people dying with um, safe deposit box keys <laughs> that they held on to, and they didn't have rights for anyone else. And oh no one my else gosh. Had in there. Yes. And there were some important papers in there. In the box so the source. Yeah. Share your safe deposit box keys. And, and where they're or access where, the they're yeah. where they are yeah. and who the other person yeah. has and that's right because you have to authorize people to access those boxes in person at the bank something like that yeah. they yeah. do yeah. Mm -hmm. in other words I can't send that card to my to my son he's got to show up at the bank mm -hmm. and sign that and then then, then he can have a key mm -hmm. okay. so lots mm -hmm. of good things to talk about I did want to let you know um, we did do um, the we have drawing forms here for a free copy of the book. And I am offering the book at a discount, including the gross receipts tax, of $20. And I just started carrying this DVD, Making Sense of Final Arrangements and Funeral Costs. This is a great DVD that shows a woman actually making calls to a funeral home for arranging a cremation or arranging a graveside funeral and how to arrange for a burial plot. It's very educational, very straightforward, and um, I love it. I, uh, I offer this through my website for $10, but if you wanted to buy the book and the DVD together, it would be $25 for both, so it's a great discount. But if you haven't entered the drawing, um, and I will send you a, PDF, a link to a PDF of the newly dead game if you wanted, <laughs> wanted to try that out uh, as well. And let me leave you with this thought uh, from Benjamin Franklin. And somebody just told me recently that this was in a letter that was written to his, the daughter of his brother who had died. He said, we are spirits, that bodies should be lent us while they can afford us pleasure, assist us in acquiring knowledge, or in doing good for our fellow creatures is a kind and benevolent act of God. When they, the bodies, become unfit for these purposes and afford us pain instead of pleasure, instead of an aid become an encumbrance, and answer none of the intentions for which they were given, it is equally kind and benevolent that a way is provided for us to be rid of them. Death is that way. Our friend and we were invited abroad on a party of pleasure, which is to last forever. His chair was ready first, and we could not all conveniently start together. And why should you and I be grieved at this, since we are soon to follow and know where to find him? So my friends, just as talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead, and your family will benefit from the conversation, and I hope you will start that conversation soon. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.